not a traditional spooky by any means, but was really spooky to me. A couple years ago I was way into mountain biking and looking for cool rocks. Anyways I took off for the day and took to one of my regular trails. It was about a 60 minute uphill followed by about 10 minutes of light downhill riding. At the bottom of the trail there was a small creek which was my go-to spot for rock hunting. Let me preface this by saying the area I was in was also a popular camping location. As I ride down I see a couple tents, but nothing out of the ordinary besides a terrible smell of feces. Again this was not too out of the ordinary for a campsite. I hop off the bike and start walking the river bank when I spotted the nicest rock I had seen. I found my rock at the edge of the camping area a little ways from a tent, but still in view. Anyway, this had to be the most beautiful rock I had ever seen smooth brown and a consistent oval shape. I stood looking at it in the sun for about a minute before I decided to touch it. I decided to touch it, it was hot. The next logical step was to rub it so I could test this perfect polish it had. I rubbed it and my finger left a streak through it. I was confused as I looked at the camper for enlightenment. He stood looking at me white as a ghost with a what have I done look. Suddenly I found my enlightenment. The smell, the streak, the look on the camper's face. If you haven't gotten the story thus far I will put in plain English. I stuck my finger in someone's diarrhea. That spooked me out of ever going rock hunting again. I kid you not, my cousin verified. There had been 12 people in the cabin. But being that everybody didn't really know each other well, nobody had really noticed that there was an extra person. And then I realized earlier that I had kind of noticed something was off. You know how when you're just moving around having a good time that you don't sweat the smallest thing, and you don't always keep track of certain stuff. I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us, and that they had been there for at least a day, eating with us. What makes it worse is, I could figure out which one because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person or the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus and we're all sitting outside, eventually we get big ass sticks and go back in the cabin, but there's nobody in there. We count again, and there's 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what happened, and the girl says that she realized too, and that when he was about to say something, the person sitting next to her had grabbed her leg hard, and leaned over toward her and said something she couldn't understand. So we are pretty much scared as we huddle together, and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up, and half the people are asleep and the other half are packing our things up. We all want to walk back home, but like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up. And some people think that we're around and still want to stay at the trailers. I just want to get out of the woods. The girl's name was Kira, the one that the goat man had touched. Anyway, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad, and she says she just wants to go home and she doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decide to split up, the four that want to go can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin and it's my uncle's and I have to lock up. I'm super angry at this point because I feel like people aren't taking this seriously, and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, now four girls and four guys, to get out of Dodge. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle and says he's going to be back. So there are just seven of us left by 4 p.m. At around 5 p.m. he hasn't made it back yet, and we're getting extremely antsy, and the only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to get a gun. It's about 5.30 p.m. or so, when the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kira is outside. We all look outside, and sure enough, she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, if she was so scared, why the hell would she come back? And then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind, the whole time the coppery smell has been gone. Now I realize I can smell just a twinge of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody, and these are the people that wanted to stay in the woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst, is laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I'm looking at them like, I'm not BS you at all right now. I ask them why would I play like that? So one of the girls goes outside to get Kira. 
She gets halfway to her and stops cold. Kira starts heaving. I don't know how to describe it. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this fact that made me realize there was not a sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like later in September, so it was still fairly hot at the time, but it was super chilly some days too. And you could usually hear big ass geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit chatting. So I step out the door and tell her to come back in the trailer right goddamn now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the door. We pull down all the shades except one, and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy turns to say that she's still there. And there's a huge bang on the door. We all jump and scramble around the living room of the trailer. The banging is super loud. So now my cousin is holding one of the girls and the other two are kinda giggling with nervous laughter and me and the other two guys are scared bricks. Then we hear Tan. He's screaming. Let me in. Stop playing. So we go over to the door and open it, and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite. Nothing weird happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kira standing there. When he had gotten to the edge of the clearing, she had turned toward him with a slack-jawed look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it was until he was almost halfway to the trailer he had realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started off by the fire, and without him even seeing her move she had been turning, inching closer. He said he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin thinking it would open. And when he got to the door and it was locked, he turned and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He pulls me to the side and whispers in my ear, you know there are only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside the trailer while we were sorting out who was going where, and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day. It has just slipped right back in. We looked out the window and there is nobody out there. So we recount everyone and then basically, I go over and ask everyone how many people were here earlier. And everybody says eight. I say, well, how many are here now? They all do the count and then realize there are only now seven people in the cabin. So Tan had brought back a couple boxes of ammo and his rifle. And he had told his dad that there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was Goatman. He says that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really terrified but I at least feel better because we can be American and shoot out of whatever it is if it comes back. But then my cousin gets into this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I'm trying to be funny and prank them, and that she's getting really scared and that I'm not funny. He keeps telling her I'm not that kind of person, and she says, well, how do we know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? Or if it's really the goat man, how do we know that this is the real Tanner and that goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we get into a huge argument about this, where me and Tan are like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking themselves into our trailer without us knowing and mingling with us, and at worst, something bad is in the forest with us. One of the girls is crying and saying she wants to go right now, and we're trying to tell her we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point the sun is starting to go down and it's getting a little cloudy out. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we can't really get a station out there with anything decent. So we turn it off at about the time that Tan's cousin shows up. He was like 19, I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon and he has one of those heavy-duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer and we whisper to Tan asking if he's sure that's his cousin and he says yes. The guy looks behind him and all around the camp, then walks in. He kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy at? I figured she would meet me up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin, 
because it smelled like blood and hot pans all the way up the trail. We are all like nope. But we ask him what he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail Tan had been using and he had come up on one of Yu's guy's buddies standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him slack-jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was just look at him. Then, she smiled at him and he said he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him and kept lagging a little behind him. He said he asked her if she was hurt or something, and if she needed any help. But, she had continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turned around a bend in the trail. But when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. He'd assumed she had taken some shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We tell him the whole story of what's been going on. I half expected him to say we were full of S, but he just listened and then sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl. He says, when she had kept trying to lag behind him, it had kinda weirded him out, so he tried to keep her in front of him, but no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little behind. And that he smelled this nasty smell, and it got stronger as he got to the camp. Eventually it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't catch, and when he had turned around she had been right up on him, and he stepped back from her. It was at this point he asked her if she was okay, and if she wasn't, him to carry her back the rest of the way, and she just kept staring. He said he reached out for her, as in to grab her on the shoulder, but he must have misjudged the distance because she was off to the side of where he had put his hand, like she had moved while he was looking dead at her. So at this point, we know this thing is real, unless Tan is playing a joke, which we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. So they load up their rifles, we eat some more, and we just kind of sit around until about 11. To this day, every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's some huge prank that my cousins played on me and just never revealed so I would fear for the rest of my life. At round 11, the stink of copper turns into an actual nasty gross blood-like smell, like cooking blood and singed hair. Tan and his cousin, Reese, get up instantly and grab the rifles. There's like a half knocking, half clawing at the door, and I kid you not, there's this voice, and it sounds like when you see those YouTube cats and dogs whose owners teach them how to talk. It says in this halting, weirdly toned voice, let me in, stop playing. It made my nuts creep up against my body, and one of the girls just starts crying and calling on Jesus. It was so obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence, and that's something that I never realized until that moment, but all people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. This thing didn't have any kind of cadence or rhythm. One of those YouTube cats, that's what it sounded like outside the door. So now I'm in full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside who is it? Stop playing around man. And it just keeps saying, in or let me in for almost 15 minutes. It sounded like this almost, just not funny. Sorry for being on a tangent, but if you can't imagine how this sounded, then you can't imagine how the whole situation was. So then the smell goes away for a while. And for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods. Every couple minutes it'll come back into the door, and say something. Finally when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning right now. Reese says, man, screw this. And opens the door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air, and says something to the affect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away. He fires two more times, and then from the woods right up against the river across from the trailer, it sounds like something is slowly gibbering and hooting. Then it starts screaming and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like I seriously have never heard anything like that, and you can hear the brush over that way start to shake, Reese fires over into the tree line and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door, and we can hear this keening and screaming. Reese says something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground and crawling toward the cabin. He had shot at it. Pretty much, that was how the rest of the night went, it was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours, and we could hear it moving out into the tree line. 
but it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tan had been sitting in the chair watching the door with his rifle, nobody else heard or saw this, and he told me two days later, after the whole thing was over. He said he had been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he had been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us and he had nodded off. Then he said he kind of realized something was wrong, and while pretending to be sleeping, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try to shoot at the thing in the cabin and have it kill us all then and there, or have Reese wake up and start shooting and then we kill ourselves. So he just stayed awake all night, pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes, it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing, or heave like it was laughing. But then it would lay back down. The story closes pretty weak, because from my perspective nothing happened. We woke up. And I noticed that Tan was a little jittery, and that he was avoiding looking at all of us. But we ate some breakfast, packed up and started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin and, and said he'd lock up and bring me my uncle's keys, to just start walking and he'd catch up. Which I didn't really want to do. We got a little bit up the path, and when he came running up, basically we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. Tan had gone back to lock up and looked in there. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was open when he went in there. I'm guessing it had been doing that all along, waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up and then getting in among us. It walked with us all the goddamn way back to his house, and then he said it lagged to the back of the group and looked him dead in the eyes before walking into the woods. There is a forest by my family home on a hill. Lots of weird stuff can be found in there from caves that go down to the beach by the bay, to giant stone obelisks, altars and walls scattered throughout the hill slopes. The structures hold a rather dark past however as they were built during a famine that devastated my country's population, which haven't recovered since. The starving people would be made build these structures for no practical reason. The local lord in the area decided that the, the populace should work for their worth, or in this case salvation, and that in return for building the structures would receive a morsel of bread. There's always been weird stories of dark Arcturitic cults that sacrifice cats on the altars and whatnot, people wandering up abandoned weather towers on top of the hill, falling through the floorboards and dying. There's also quite a bit of doggers, who congregate at the car park at the edge of the forest. It's a pretty great place to walk your dog, as there are countless strange occult structures of mesoamerican styled pyramids and old beehive huts. There's also good mountain bike tracks running down along the hillside that are dodgy as hell because of the old ruins sunk into the pine loam. Also a great place to go mushroom hunting once the season hits. In 2016 my boyfriend, now my husband, and I went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. Camping was free, no cell service, barely a road, etc. We did encounter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all but they were creepy so I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road a little as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually my boyfriend had no problem helping someone but he said his time something about her put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help and usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. She looked like she just expected we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said anyway, I hadn't really noticed anything that's strange about her. The next person came when we had chosen a spot and were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car and the man in the car watched us each time he passed. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. It had been raining and everything was muddy and we wanted the driest site possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. 
He didn't come by another time so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything else to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent and sometime around 3 am we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well or even remember exactly what it sounded like but my boyfriend said it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker is another way he described it. He jumped up and looked out the little window but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself another few times. I was too scared to speak so my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should go back to sleep. I didn't question this as I figured loud sounds could be easily heard miles off. After we left he told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road but he didn't want to freak me out. Looking back I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if apparently the sound was far off. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a while longer when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed because we were leaving. I got got alarmed by this and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete we had bought just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own, but despite the moon providing plenty of light I couldn't really see. I did point out something my boyfriend hadn't noticed though before we got into the car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hasn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While we were driving away my boyfriend explained that he was nervous someone might have been trying to lure us out, so he didn't think it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find out gas tank had been siphoned out, but that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joke that that would make a funny hybrid commercial. Number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid, too. We only joke because we were about dying ourselves from fear and adrenaline even then. The rest of our trip we only stayed in well-populated campsites or got a hotel. When I was in the scouts, or rather the local equivalent, legally adult scouts had to do the three feather challenge. One day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp, unseen by any human, after which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the campmaster. It was my third day, so I took off, walked for miles through the woods and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods. Spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn when I decide to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back. I stripped nude, and went towards the lake, but noticed a group of guys fishing so decided to go back. Suddenly, the ground underneath my feet caved in, and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was a pit where poacher dumped the guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer, and it fermented for weeks. Imagine the scene, a group of anglers hear some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods, and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager-shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten awful, who is crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground, while shrieking and weeping then runs at them, to get to the lake and wash off. One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeast US. Haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age, but I remember about 8 to 9 years back he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park several days in a row, and found out they were visiting from out west, and they had gotten engaged their decades prior. They had been searching for a spot they'd taken pics of where he popped the question but were having trouble. After looking at the pics and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought it would be. They found it, and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back, and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. 
he found both of them lying down spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both committed suicide by ingesting some sort of chemical-slash-pill combination medley. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My bud wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad for about them dying, but said that he thought they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think they helped kill them. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana-slash-Wyoming area and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants, so I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear in saddlebags or saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes, so she led me on a bit of a side journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse, too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It is one of those you can plug in or wind up, and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries quickly. I do and, out in the middle of nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees then back to the ground, then it snakes around rocks and finally dead ends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing, just this outlet and this desk. I am staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. That man then lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. Weird. No spooky jump scares or bodies, just one lone power desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I had taken a picture of it. I've got a deep wood story that's been shared in my family for quite a few years. My great uncle was a deep woods kind of guy. In a practice I find a little weird, he would rarely use a tent, just set up a sleeping bag right on the ground. Since we're from Maine, there aren't too many large predators that really mess with people. There are black bears, but they usually hide from people so I guess he just didn't feel worried. So, he's out sleeping in the woods, when he feels tiny hands patting his face. Wakes up, opens his eyes to see a raccoon standing over him, just feeling his face. So what does my great uncle do? He just goes back to sleep. I was camping in the Everglades. As I mentioned in another post, due to back problems I sleep in the back of my car. What I didn't mention is it's a convertible with a cloth top. I hear something walking on it. I know it's a raccoon and I can tell it's pretty heavy. I'm worried he'll rip through the top. So I push at it to try to get him off. He leaves, but he comes back. This goes on for a while. Then it stops, so I try to go to sleep. It was December, but it was still warm so I had the windows open. I hear something, and when I open my eyes the raccoon is sitting in the driver's seat staring at me over the back of it. I chase him out. Still can't sleep, so I go to the bathroom. 
Next morning I get up and the wrapper from the loaf of bread that I had stored in the well behind the back seat where the convertible top folds into is lying there empty under a tree. When I was in the bathroom the raccoon had climbed in and stolen it. I felt sorry for the raccoon. That was 18 slices of double fiber bread. So 126 grams of fiber in one sitting. I could only imagine what it did to his digestive system. Not a ranger, but was hiking in Andorra with a friend. Long story short, we got lost off the trail and ended up in Spain. Found another trail and were following it, without a map. A while ahead of us we see a man with two golden retrievers walking in the same direction we are. He looks young and is carrying climbing gear over his shoulder. We're rushing down the trail to catch up with him and finally do. We ask him for help with directions, and he tells us exactly where we are and where we need to be, about 12 kilometers away there's a town with a hotel. He says there's another, smaller, town about 6 kilometers away and that he parked his car there. He says he can give us a lift for the last 6 kilometers if we like, but says that he's in a hurry. We are over the moon and so we hike together for a while. The dogs are nice and friendly, running circles around us. We are chatting away to the guide and he is really nice, but my friend and I are getting tired and so we cannot keep pace with him for long. The trail bends away to the right and the man, now a bit ahead of us, disappears behind the bend. We get there a couple of minutes later, and the trail is empty, no man, and no dogs, even though the trail is a straight run for quite a while and we should have been able to see them. The two of us continue on, alarmed, waiting to hear slash see something, or perhaps be murdered by a stranger. Nothing. We get to the town eventually, and from there made it to the safety of the hotel in the next town over. We were completely freaked out by his sudden disappearance and to this day we are both convinced he was a ghost. Ex-Ranger here. We had a group of frat boys making way too much noise. We came by twice, and at the second stop, I told them, this is your last warning. Not only is it rude for other campers to be so loud, it's exceptionally dangerous. Everyone knows that the local mountain lions are attracted to loud noises at night, and these ghost cats, as they are called, can creep right up on you without you hearing or seeing them. Whatever you do, don't leave your tent tonight, if you hear anything don't make a sound. We went back to the station, grabbed the lion pelt from the interp center and the night vision goggles, Head Ranger had to blow what was left of the budget at the end of the previous year. Once they were all in their tents, we crept into the campsite and made fake lion tracks everywhere. We set up the lion pelt propped up over some sticks. The other Ranger got out the PA and from a distance started doing fake lion calls, slowing getting closer. I pulled the jeep forward like we were arriving on scene and got out. Turned on my mag light and illuminated the silhouette of the lion pelt. Because I was moving quickly, the shadow of the lion appeared to me moving. At this point the frat boys were losing it. Jim, the other ranger, shouted stay in your tents, followed shortly by she's coming around at us, and then there's another one. And finally, let's get out of here. At that point, we turned off the flashlights, grabbed the lion pelt in the darkness and jumped in the jeep and sped off. Just after sunrise they started peeking out of the tents. Nobody was brave enough to get out until about 8.30. When they saw all the huge paw and claw prints everywhere they really freaked out. I grew up in Central Oregon, and there's a reservation called Warm Springs about two or so hours from where I lived. I only mention that because a lot of people in my area have friends there, and a lot of the land in that area belongs to that tribe. When I was a kid, we used to go camping up there. Not on the Rees, of course, but in that area, and I met a lot of kids who grew up there. I got to know one kid really well, his name was Nolan, and we ended up hanging out a lot when our families were in the area. Our folks got to know each other so we'd all get in touch and camp out around the same time. We'd camp for about two weeks, so we were out there for a long time. I asked him if he camped in an RV, yeah, my dad had one, so I guess it wasn't really camping but we'd take our tents and stuff and set them up out away from camp most nights. 
I didn't like sleeping in there because I like being outside. We talked for a bit about camping. So anyway, sorry, one year Nolan and I were out there, I think we must have been like 12 or so. We wanted to go out and camp near the river because we wanted to try night fishing, I think we must have been about a third of a mile from the main camp. Far enough away that we couldn't hear or see anyone else, I remember that. We were messing around most of the day, I don't really remember much about it, but we ended up building a fire at some point and I was really impressed because he had this flint or something that he used to start it. I'd never seen anyone do that before so I thought it was pretty cool. I got him to teach me how to do it and we lit some stuff on fire, which looking back was really stupid because it was the middle of summer, and if I remember right the fire warning was either at yellow or orange. But thankfully we didn't start anything major, and when it got dark we sat around and talked about whatever it is 12 year olds talk about, I don't really remember. What I do remember is that at some point, he looked over my shoulder at the river and asked me if I could see something. The way our camp was set up, we were about 10 feet from the river, and we were at the widest point, so it was probably about 20 feet to the other bank. It gets hot up there in the summer but the water is still cold, which is important. I look over my shoulder and I could see something wading into the river on the other side. From where we were it looked like a deer but we couldn't really tell because of the fire. I got up to look closer and I saw a pair of antlers, so I figured it was a buck but I thought it was weird that it was wading into the water, and it was definitely heading for us, and I asked Nolan what he thought we should do. He's looking at the fire with this weird expression and he tells me to sit down and shut up, so I do, because I'd never seen him act that way before. He's whispering at me to ignore it, and to just keep talking like we were but I couldn't think of anything to say. He was saying something about an episode of some show, but I could hear the deer coming through the water, so I wasn't really paying any attention, and I kept trying to see over his shoulder, but every time I did he'd sort of hit me on the arm and make me look at him. I wasn't really scared, I remember, I was just sort of confused. But then I hear the deer come out of the water, and I could kind of make out what it looked like, and I realized it wasn't a deer because whatever it was was walking on two legs. I started to get up. I was super freaked out, but Nolan just yanked me back down and talked louder about this television show, and I could tell he was just as scared as I was, probably even more. He leaned in and poked the fire with a stick, and he whispered that whatever I do, I can't speak to it. I could see it come closer, and it stood right behind Nolan's back. I was about ready to pee my pants, and I think I'd probably have run if I'd been alone but I didn't want to leave Nolan so I kept sitting really still and sneaking glances at it. It wasn't that tall, but the way it carried itself was just wrong, like its center of balance was screwed up. I can't really describe it, but it was kind of like it kept shifting too far forward. It just stood there behind Nolan for a long time, and eventually Nolan ran out of things to say and we just kind of sat there for a second. The fire was making noise, but I thought I could hear this thing talking in a really low voice. I couldn't hear what it was saying, and I leaned forward a tiny little bit, and I actually DIDP my pants when it leaned forward too. I couldn't see its face, but I saw its eyes. They were cloudy and milky, and if you want to know what they look like, find that scene from Lord of the Rings where Frodo falls in that lake and all the dead people are floating toward him. That's what its eyes looked like. So all I saw were these two white eyes floating above Nolan's head, and the really vague shape of the antlers coming out of its head. I don't know what my face looked like but at exactly the same time Nolan and I booked it out of there, and we ran non-stop until we got back to the main camp. My pants were soaked with pee, so I took them off as we were running and threw them in the bushes. We both stopped once we were in front of my dad's RV and we couldn't see anything chasing us, so we stood there and caught our breath. I asked him what that thing was but he said he didn't know. He said his grandpa had only warned him that if anything ever came up to him when he was out in the desert, he was never, ever supposed to talk to it or listen to anything it had to say. I wanted to know if he'd heard it talking to, and he said that the only thing he'd been able to understand was help you. I think we ended up sleeping in the RV with my parents, and the next night we went back out and didn't see anything.
We were having dinner in town, five of us including myself. This guy, he was repainting an information booth and heard a man ask him for directions to the nearest campsite. He didn't turn around because he was up on a ladder, but he informed the man that there weren't any campsites nearby, but that if he headed down the road about four miles, he'd find one at another park. He asked if he could be of any other help, but the man said no and thanked him. My friend said he kept painting, but he was listening and never heard the man leave. The second he came up and talked to me, the hairs on my neck stood up, but I wasn't sure why. I just had this really uneasy feeling about the whole thing, and I wanted to finish painting and get out of there. I figured maybe part of it was that I couldn't turn around to look at him, but something just felt off. There was also this weird smell floating around even before the guy talked to me, kind of like old period blood. I had looked around to see what was causing it but I didn't find anything. So I waited for the guy to walk away, but I didn't hear him leave, which made me think he was just standing there and watching me, so I asked again if I could do anything for him, and he didn't answer. I knew he was there though, because I hadn't heard him leave, so I did this awkward turn on the ladder to look down and see what he was doing. Now I admit it could have just been my brain mess up, but I swear to you, Russ, for a split second when I turned around, that man didn't have a face. Like he had no face. It was almost concave, and totally smooth, and I just about had a heart attack because I couldn't even wrap my brain around what I was seeing. I think I started to say something but there was this kind of pop inside my head and suddenly he was just a normal looking guy. I must have looked weird because he asked me if I was okay, and I was just like yeah, I'm fine. He asks about the campsite again and I point to where he has to go, and he's like I'm not from around here, can you help me get there? Now this is when I know something is really up because there's no way this guy got out here and didn't know where he was. And for that matter, there's no car around, so how did he get here in the first place? I said I was sorry but that I couldn't take him anywhere in a company vehicle, and he's like please? I really don't know where I am, can you come with me and help me get there? So now I'm seriously weirded out, and I start wondering if this is some kind of ambush or whatever. I told him I could call him a taxi to come out and take him where he wants to go, and I pull out my phone and he just goes no and walks away really quickly. But he doesn't walk out of the park, he walks back into the trees and I got right in my truck and start to get out of there, the paint or whatever. I looked in my mirror to see where he was as I was leaving and he was standing right at the tree line again, I don't know how he got there so fast, but this time I know that he didn't have a face. He was just watching me leave, and right before I turned the corner he took a big step back into the trees and kind of dissolved, I guess. Maybe it was just dark so he blended in, but it felt more like he just melted away. Interestingly, right after this guy finished his story, someone else, piped up with another one, but with a slightly different twist. You know actually, I had something sort of weird like that happen a while back. I was out doing some trail scouting. And I was out in the middle of nowhere figuring out where we were gonna have this trail run through. I hadn't seen anyone else for probably a good two hours, so I wasn't really paying attention to where I was going, I was just looking at the ground for the most part. Then out of nowhere, I crested this little hill and almost ran into this guy. He was older, probably in his 60s, and I started to apologize to him for running into him. And then I noticed his face, and I probably looked like a complete douchebag because I stopped and just stared at him. It took me a second to figure out what was wrong, but this guy's face was huge. I know that sounds weird, but that's the only way I can describe it. His head wasn't big or anything, it was normal, but the amount of space his face took up was just way too much. Like if you took someone's face and enlarged it all by about two times. He doesn't say anything, he just kind of looks at me, and I backed up and was kind of stuttering and saying I was sorry, and I went around him and got out of there and did what I needed to do. The whole time, I kept looking behind me because I was so freaked out that he'd pop up behind me or something. I know it sounds ridiculous but I swear to you it was one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. I switched the topic to the stairs a little later, and there was a definite shift in enthusiasm. No one spoke up at first. There is a real stigma around discussing them, even when we're away from work. 
but I broke the ice with a story of my own, and the guy who told the story about the faceless man told this one, albeit very quietly. A couple of years ago, I was camping with my girlfriend, and we're out about two miles from the road at this site I know. We went to bed that night, but we couldn't sleep because someone interjected a funny comment, and we were dangerously close to going off on another subject, but I got us back on track. Yeah, really funny, you. No, it was because we kept hearing that grinding noise. My brother used to grind his teeth in his sleep, and it kind of reminds me of that. My girlfriend was freaking out but I just kept telling her to ignore it because I've heard it before and you just have to ignore it. It goes away eventually, you guys know what I mean. We all knew what he meant. So eventually I got her to go to sleep, but I woke up probably two hours later because something was just off. I rolled over and she wasn't there, and I kind of freaked out, because. He thought for a second and then he took a very long drink. Anyway, I ran out of the tent calling her name, but I didn't have to go far. She was standing at the edge of the camp looking at something in the trees and I could see she was really pale. The fire was low but bright enough to see her. Anyway, so I ran up to see what was going on and she was dead asleep, but her eyes were open. She had this real spaced outlook, you know. So I put my arm around her to lead her back, but she wouldn't move. She just said really quietly something like I have to go now, Eddie. I have to go, it's here. I was like you were just sleepwalking, come back to bed but she wouldn't budge. She just kept standing there and saying that she had to go. And I looked where she was looking, and there was a staircase right there about 15 yards away. Gray one, concrete. And she started to walk toward it but I yanked her back and that woke her up. She looked at me like I was out of my mind, and she asked what she was doing out of the tent. I didn't tell her anything, I just told her she was sleepwalking. The grinding was gone, so she just went back to the tent with me and fell asleep again. I don't know. I don't like thinking about it, you know? We all knew. You guys remember that kid with. I can't remember what it was, some kind of brain mess up, not downs but something like it. Someone else brought up. Well I got to read the report he gave when they found him a week after he went missing and it was beyond belief. I mean you have to take it with a grain of salt because who knows what that kid actually thinks is real, but some of this stuff, I don't think he could have made up. Like what? Well first of all, he talked about the stairs. He said he'd been watching his dad build a fire and the stairs came up to him, and he had to go up them or something bad would happen. The cops couldn't really understand what he was talking about after that, because he just kept saying like the campfire over and over. And he kept mentioning sounds, but he couldn't say what sounds, just that it was loud, and he covered his ears so he couldn't hear them. But the thing I remember most is that they asked him where exactly he'd gone, and he just said he was right there. He kept pointing at himself, and they said they thought that meant that he thought he'd never left. He said he wasn't scared because the stairs were there and he said they talked to him, but not like people talk. Like I said, it was really convoluted and hard to understand, and I have a feeling the cops didn't take most of it down. They ended up just saying that the kid had some kind of amnesia or fugue, and that they didn't think foul play was involved. Doesn't really explain why he came back a week later perfectly fine without a speck of dirt on him and well fed, but hey, what the cops say goes. The first happened on a case that I went out on right after I got out of training, and was still pretty new to everything. Before I took this job, I was a volunteer, so I had a basic idea of what to expect, but on those calls you're mostly dealing with finding lost people after vets have found signs of them. As an SAR officer, you go out for all kinds of cases, from animal bites to heart attacks. This case got called in early in the morning, from a young couple who were up on one of the trails that goes by the lake. The husband was completely hysterical, and we couldn't really figure out what was going on. We could hear the woman screaming in the background, and he was begging us to come up there right away. When we get there, we see him holding his wife, and she's got something in her arms. She's screaming these awful, almost animal-like screams, and he's sobbing. He sees us and he screams at us to help them, 
to please get an ambulance up there. Now obviously we can't just drive an ambulance up the walking path, so we ask him if his wife needs help, or if she can walk on her own. He's still hysterical, but he manages to tell us that it's not his wife that needs help. I go over while one of the vets tries to calm him down, and I ask the wife what's going on. She's rocking, holding something, and just shrieking, over and over. I crouch down and see that whatever she's holding, it's covering her with blood. That's when I notice the sling on her front and my heart sinks. I ask her to tell me what's going on, and I sort of pry her arms gently open so I can see what she's holding. It's her baby, obviously dead. His head is caved in on one side, and he's covered in scratches. Now, I've seen dead bodies before, but something about this whole situation hits me hard. I have to take a second to compose myself, and I get up and go get one of the other vets, who's standing by. I tell him that it's a dead kid, and he sort of pats my shoulder and tells me he'll deal with it. It took us over an hour to get this woman to let us see her kid. Every time we try to take him from her, she flips out and tells us we can't have him, that he'll be okay if we just leave her alone and let her help him. But eventually, one of the vets manages to calm her down and she gives us the body. We took it back to the med area, but when the EMT showed up, they told us that there was never any hope of saving the kid. He died instantly from the trauma to his head. I was good buddies with one of the nurses who met them at the hospital, and she told me later what had happened. Turns out the couple had been walking with the baby in the sling, and they stopped because the kid was fussing. The dad takes the kid and is holding him, looking out over this little gully by the path. The mom comes to stand next to him, but she ends up stepping on a loose patch of soil, and she trips. She falls into the dad, who drops the kid, who ends up falling about 20 feet down this little gully onto the rocks at the bottom. The dad climbed down and recovered the kid, but he'd fallen right on his head, and was dead by the time he got there. The baby was only about 15 months old. It was a total freak accident, a series of events that coalesced into the worst possible outcome probably one of the more awful calls I've been on. I haven't seen a lot of animal bites in my time as an SAR officer, mostly because there aren't that many animals that come around the area. While there are bears in the area, they tend to stay pretty far away from people, and sightings are highly unusual. Most of the animals you'll see are small ones, like coyotes, raccoons, or skunks. What we do see frequently, though, are moose. And let me tell you, moose are nasty fuckers. They'll chase after anything for any reason, and God help you if you get in between a female and its baby. One of the more amusing calls was of a guy who'd gotten chased down by an absolutely massive male moose, and was stuck up a tree. Took us almost an hour to get him down, and when he was finally on solid ground again, he looks at me and says, God damn. Them fuckers is big up close. I guess that's not really a scary story, but we still laugh about that one. I honestly don't know how I'd forgotten this story, but it is, by far, the scariest thing that's happened to me. I guess maybe I've tried so long to forget about it that it just didn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all of their time in the woods, you don't ever want to let yourself get scared of being alone, or out in the middle of nowhere. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them and move on. This is, to date, the only thing that's ever made me really seriously consider if this job is the right one for me. I don't really like talking about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. As I recall, this took place right at the end of spring. It was a typical lost child call, a four-year-old girl had wandered away from her family's campsite, and had been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent, and told us what most parents do. My kid would never wander away, she's so good about staying close, she's never done anything like this before. We assure the parents that we'll do everything we can to find her, and we spread out in a standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies, and we were sort of casually holding conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but you do sort of become desensitized when you've done this long enough. It becomes the norm, and I think to a certain extent you have to learn to desensitize yourself in order to work this job. We search for a good two hours, going well beyond where we think she'd be, 
and we come out of a small valley when something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze and look at each other, and there's almost a sensation like a plane depressurizing. My ears pop, and I have this odd sensation of having dropped about 10 feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that, but before I can, we hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It's almost like a freight train passing directly by us, but it's coming from every direction at once, including above and below us. He screams something to me, but I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freaked out, we look all around us, trying to find the source of the sound, but neither of us sees anything. Of course, my first thought is a landslide, but we're not near any cliffs, and even if we were, it would have hit us by now. The sound goes on and on, and we're trying to yell to each other, but even standing close together we can't hear anything but this sound. Then, as suddenly as it starts, it stops, like someone threw a switch and cut it off. We stand there for a second, perfectly still, and slowly the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asks me what the fuck just happened, but I just kind of shrug, and we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I get on the radio and ask if anyone else just heard the end of the fucking world, but no one else hears it, even though we're all within shouting distance of each other. My buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. About an hour later, we all check up on the radios, and no one's found the little girl. Most of the time, we won't search when it gets dark, but because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy. We keep close together, and we're calling out for her every couple of minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her, because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being out all alone in the dark is awful. The woods can be intimidating to kids in the daylight, at night, well, it's a whole different beast. But we're not seeing any signs of her, or getting any responses, and around midnight, we decide to turn around and head back to the rendezvous point. We're about halfway back when my buddy stops and shines his light to the right of us, into a really thick deadfall, or group of dead trees. I ask him if he's heard a response, but he just tells me to be quiet a second and listen. I do, and in the distance, I can hear what sounds like a kid crying. We both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response, but it's just this really faint crying. We head in the direction of this deadfall and go around it, calling her name over and over. As we get closer to the crying, I start getting this weird feeling in my gut, and I tell my buddy that something isn't right. He tells me he feels the same way, but we can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are, and call the girl's name again. And at the same time, we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. It's the same little hitching sob, then wail, then quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time, and without saying another word, we both take off running. It's the only time I've ever lost my composure like that, but something about it was so incredibly wrong, and neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else had heard anything strange, but no one else knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but that call fucked me up for a long time. As for the little girl, we never found a trace of her. We keep an eye out for her, and all the other people who we've never found, but frankly I doubt we'll ever find anything. Of the missing persons calls I've gone out on. Only a handful have ever resulted in a complete disappearance, meaning no trace of the person and no body ever found. But sometimes, finding a body just leads to more questions than answers. Here are some of the bodies we've found that have become infamous in our team, a teenage boy whose remains were recovered almost a year after he vanished. We found the top of his skull, two finger bones, and his camera almost 40 miles from where he was last seen. The camera, sadly was destroyed. The pelvis of an older man who had vanished a month earlier. That was all we found. The lower jaw and right foot of a two-year-old boy on the highest peak of a ridge in the southern part of the park. The body of a 10-year-old girl with Down syndrome, almost 20 miles from where she'd vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing, and all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. The coroner said it appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were no suspects ever identified. 
The frozen body of a one-year-old baby, found a week after vanishing in the hollow trunk of a tree 10 miles from the area he was seen last. There was fresh milk found in his stomach, but his tongue was gone. A single vertebra and right kneecap of a three-year-old girl, found in the snow almost 20 miles from the campground her family had been at the previous summer. My buddy has been an SAR officer for about seven years, he started when he was a junior in college, and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was to never go near, touch, or ascend them. For the first year, he did just that, but apparently his curiosity got the better of him, and on one call he broke away from the line and went to go check a set of them out. He said they were about 10 miles from the path where a teenage girl had vanished, and the dogs were following a scent. He was on his own, lagging behind the main group, when he saw a set of stairs off to his left. They looked like they were from a new house, because the carpeting was pristine and white. He said that as he got closer, he didn't feel any different, or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears or collapsing, but he got right up next to them and didn't feel anything. The only thing, he said, that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps. No dirt, leaves, dust, anything. And there didn't appear to be any signs of animal or insect activity in the immediate area, which he found strange. It was less like things were avoiding them, and more like they just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs, and didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly climbed the stairs, he said it was terrifying, because the way they'd been stigmatized, he wasn't really sure what was going to happen to him. He joked that half of him expected to be teleported to some other dimension and the other half was watching for a UFO to come swooping down. But he got to the top with little event and he stood there looking around. But, he said, the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very, very wrong. He described it as the feeling you'd get if you were in a part of a government building you have no business being in. As if someone was going to come and arrest you, or shoot you in the back of the head, at any second. He tried to brush it off, but the feeling got stronger and stronger, and that's when he realized that he couldn't hear anything anymore. The sounds of the forest were gone, and he couldn't hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of weird, awful tinnitus, but more oppressive. He climbed back down and rejoined the search, and didn't mention what he'd done. But, he said, the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting back at the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this look of intense anger, and he asked what was wrong. You went up them, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased as a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer just shook his head. Because we didn't find her. The dogs lost her scent. My buddy asked what that had to do with anything. The trainer asked how long he'd been on the stairs, and my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead eyed look, and told him that if he ever went up another set of stairs again, he'd be fired. Immediately. The trainer walked away, and I guess he's never answered any of the questions my buddy has asked him about it since. The little boy vanished from a picnic area in the late fall. In addition to the mental disability, he was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said they searched for this kid for weeks, going miles out of the accepted range, but it was like he'd never been there. The dogs couldn't pick up his scent anywhere, not even in the picnic area where he'd apparently vanished from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated, and hadn't done anything sinister to their kid. The search was concluded about a month later, and my buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten it by later in the winter. He was out on a training op in the snow, on one of the higher peaks, when he came across something in the snow. He said he saw it from far away at first, and when he got closer, he realized it was a shirt, frozen and sticking part way out of the powder. He recognized it as belonging to the kid, because it had a distinctive pattern. About 20 yards away, he found the kid's body, laying partially buried in the snow. 
My buddy said there was no way the kid had been dead for any more than a few days, even though he'd been missing for almost three months. The kid was curled around something, and when my buddy brushed off the snow to see what it was, he said he almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a big chunk of ice, that had been carved crudely to look sort of like a person. The kid was holding it so tight that it had frostbitten his chest and hands, which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He radioed the rest of the crew, and they took the body off the mountain. Now, he recapped all of this for me, and to put it simply, there was no way this kid could have both survived for almost three months on his own, or have gotten to this peak. There was no physical way this child could have walked almost 50 miles and ended up on the top of a goddamn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or colon. Nothing, not even water. It was like, my buddy said, the kid it had been taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation and dropped on this mountain months later, only to die of exposure. He's never really gotten over that one. They were out doing a recon for mountain lions, because there had been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals are seen to ensure that if they are in the area, we can warn people and close off those trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested part of the park toward dusk when he heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, when a mountain lion screams, it sounds almost exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. It's unsettling, but far from abnormal. My buddy radioed back and let Ops know that he'd heard one, and that he was going to keep going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always from the same spot, and determined the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard another scream, this time within only a few yards of him. Of course, he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace, because the last thing he wants is to run into a goddamn mountain lion and get mauled to death. As he got back on the path and started heading back, the screaming followed him, and he broke into a jog. When he was about a mile from Ops, the screaming stopped, and he turned around to see if it was following him. It was almost night by this point, but he said in the distance, just before the path rounded a corner, he could see what looked like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them that the paths were closed, and that he needed to come back to the welcome center. The figure just stood there, and my buddy started to walk over. When he was about 10 yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step toward him and let out the same scream my buddy had been hearing. My buddy didn't even say anything, he just turned and sprinted back to Ops, never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention it to anyone else, just said that there was a mountain lion in the area and that they would need to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. I used to backpack alone all the time in the woods, and after this I think my lone backpacking adventure days are over. WTF. I will say that I have had strange things happen, but nothing even close to this to make me want to stop going altogether. One time I was out camping by a river and I was sleeping peacefully. Then all of a sudden I woke up, it was just a feeling that I had, something primitive. Then all the forest sounds simply came to a halt, all the bugs, frogs, etc. Simply shut up about two minutes after I woke up, that was creepy in itself. The next thing I knew there was a blood-curdling scream, like a woman screaming at the top of her lungs like she is being murdered, but with quite a demonic tone behind it. It was near my campsite and it would scream to the right of me and the next thing I knew it screamed in front of me, then behind me. I didn't hear any steps or movement of something outside, but the screams came from different place every time. Then all of a sudden the forest came busting back to life and the frogs, crickets, etc. were going full force, almost like they were being as loud as they could to help forget about what just happened. Shit was freaky. This whole time I thought it was a bobcat or a puma, but now. Who knows? The other time I was camping way deep in the Appalachian Mountains with my dogs, like 10 miles to walk in any direction to get to any kind or forest service road. Same kind of thing happened. I was having a good old time by the campfire late at night, just me and my dog, 
when all of a sudden I got this strange feeling and my dog tucked her tail and sat right next to me. The next thing I knew I started hearing this weird ass noise, like something one would hear from Star Trek or something. It sounded like something you would hear when a portal would open from the movies, like a loud buzzing, humming type of noise, but nothing like electrical lines or anything like that, it's hard to explain. It lasted only about 3-4 to four seconds every time it happened, but it happened again and again. It sounded like it was directly on top of me, but I couldn't see when I looked up. But the sound itself almost gave itself body, like it was tangible and I could touch it. It is hard as hell to explain, but that's pretty much as accurate as a description as I can give. This went on for about 5 minutes, and my dog was doing the whole slanting her head way to the side every time the sound started and looked up at the exact same place I looked, which was directly over my head. I swear I could have reached up and touched the sound. After the sound went away I went to sleep and was woken up at about 3 in the morning with the largest pack of koidos I have ever heard howling at the moon. They literally encircled my tent and just straight howled their lungs out for a good 30 minutes, it scared me. There had to have been about 20 of them minimum. I could see their silhouettes right outside the tent because the moon was bright as hell. It was actually neat to have witnessed the coyotes singing to the night, but was weird that both those things happened in the same night. Jackie Lincoln is a vet who's been a park ranger officer for about 15 years. She specializes in high elevation mountain rescues, and is widely considered one of the best in her field. She was one of the more enthusiastic storytellers, and since we were together a fair amount during exercises, she ended up telling me about four that really stuck with me. The first she told me in response to my asking about her most traumatic calls. She shook her head and told me that really bad calls happen more frequently on the mountain, since the potential for nasty accidents is higher. About five years ago, one of the parks she worked at had a string of disappearances. It was a bad year, she said, one of the worst on record as far as weather went. They were getting about a foot of new snow every couple of days, and there were a few avalanches that killed some climbers. They'd warned people about staying on the mapped areas, but of course there's always those who don't listen. In one particularly nasty case, an entire family got wiped out because the father decided he knew better than the officials, and he took them out into an area that wasn't safe. They were snowshoeing, and as best she could figure, they'd walked onto a shelf of snow that looked solid, but actually wasn't. It gave way, and this family went ass over tea kettle almost 300 feet down a slope. They landed on the rocks at the bottom, and the parents died instantly. One of the kids did as well, but the other two survived. One had a broken leg and fractured ribs, the other was almost unharmed save for some bruising and a sprained ankle. The uninjured child left his sibling behind and set out to find help. Jackie said the kid didn't make it more than half a mile before a storm overtook him. Kid stopped to try and get warm, or maybe just to rest, and ended up freezing to death. They ended up finding the family with the help of some witnesses who saw them heading out into the wilderness, and she was the one to find the kid who'd frozen to death looking for help. She said it had started to snow, just enough to obscure long-distance vision, but not enough to make searching impossible. She saw a figure sitting in the snow up ahead, and she got to it as quickly as possible. She described, in detail, how as she got closer, she realized first that it was a child, second that they were deceased, and third that they had frozen in one of the most pitiful positions she's ever found a corpse in. The kid was sitting upright, with his knees tucked up against his chest. His arms were curled around them, and his head was tucked up in his coat. When she moved the coat to look at his face, she saw that he died crying. His face was twisted, and the tears were frozen on his cheeks. She said it was painfully obvious that the kid was terrified when he succumbed to hypothermia, and as a mother, it broke her heart. She told me, repeatedly, that she hopes the father is burning in hell as we speak. The other traumatic story she told me that stood out, in my mind, was one that happened when she was a rookie. Her team got a report of an experienced climber who hadn't come home the previous day. 
His wife was convinced that something bad had happened, because he'd never failed to come home on time. They went out looking for him, and had to climb what sounded like some very technically challenging parts of the mountain. They got to a relatively flat area, and Jackie started seeing blood in the snow. She followed the trail, and as she went, she started seeing little bits of tissue. She wasn't sure exactly what body part it had come from, but the farther she followed it, the more there was. She follows this blood and tissue trail to a sheltered area under a cliff face, and she finds the climber. She said there was so much blood, more than she'd ever seen before. He was lying face down, one arm stretched in front of him, as if he died crawling. She looks closer, and sees that he's been partially disemboweled, which is where the tissue she'd seen had come from. The guy has an ice pick tucked into a hip holster, and it's covered in blood. Of course, they'll never be sure exactly what happened, but she said as best she can figure, this is what went down. The guy had been attempting to climb up to the next area, and had been using his ice axe to ascend. He'd probably hit a loose patch, and had fallen. On the way down, or possibly when he landed, he'd gotten impaled by the axe, and it had disemboweled him. He drug himself along, tearing pieces of himself out as he went, and had died under the cliff face. She isn't terribly bothered by gore, but I guess a few of the guys who came to help her remove the body threw up when they turned him over and a good portion of his intestines spilled out. I mentioned to her that I was interested in hearing about any experiences she had with people completely disappearing. Her eyes light up, and she leans in close to me. Wanna hear a real doozy? She asks. She tells me about how, when she first started. There was a case that got a lot of attention in the media. A family had been out berry picking in an area of the forest very close to the entrance of the park. They had two little boys, both under the age of five, and at some point during the day, one of them vanishes. There's an absolutely massive search, and they find absolutely nothing. It's another of those cases where it's like the kid was never there in the first place. The dogs just sit down and don't pick up on anything, no trace of the kid is found. The search goes on for about two months, but is eventually called off. Fast forward to six months later. The family comes back to place flowers at a memorial that's been set up there for the kid. They bring their other son. While they're placing the flowers, they lose sight of the kid for about three seconds, and in that span of time he vanishes into thin air. Now obviously, the parents are beyond devastated. It's awful enough to lose one child, but to lose two is beyond imagining. The search is huge, one of the largest in state history. There are about 300 volunteers combing every inch of this park, looking for the kid. But again, there's no trace of him. The search goes on for about a week, with people looking miles from the part of the park he vanished from. And then, almost two weeks later, a volunteer almost 15 miles from the designated search area radios in that he's found the kid. They assume that the kid was dead, but the volunteer says he's not only alive, he's in good shape. Jackie and her team go out to recover the kid, and when they get there, she can't believe that this is the kid that's been missing. His clothes are clean, there's no dirt on him anywhere, and he doesn't appear traumatized. The volunteer says he found the kid sitting on a log, playing with a little twig bundle that's bound together with some old rope. Jackie asks him where he's been, who he was with for those two weeks, and the kid tells her that he's been with the fuzzy man. Now Jackie firmly believes in Bigfoot, so she gets all excited and asks what he means by fuzzy. Was he hairy? But the kid says no, he wasn't hairy. He was a fuzzy man, and he describes a man that's blurry, like when you close your eyes but not all the way closed. He says the man came out of the trees and took the kid with him deep into the woods. The kid says he slept in a hollow tree, and the fuzzy man gave him berries to eat. Jackie asks if the man was mean, if he scared the kid, and the kid says no, he wasn't scary. But I didn't like how he didn't have eyes. Jackie says they get the kid back to headquarters, and a cop takes him into town to talk to him more about what happened. She's friends with the cop that talked to him, and she said the kid described being kept in this tree by the fuzzy man, and given berries whenever he was hungry. He was allowed to wander around a very specific clearing, but when he tried to go further, the fuzzy man would get mad and yell real loud even though he didn't have a mouth. 
When the kid got scared at night, the fuzzy man made it go brighter and gave him the twig bundle. He said the fuzzy man was going to keep him, but he had to let him go because the kid wasn't the right kind. He either can't or won't elaborate more on that. The cops are just sort of left scratching their heads, and the search for his brother is renewed with no results. The kid has no idea where his brother might be, and they never find him. The last story that Jackie told me was of something that happened to her when she got separated from her training group when she was a rookie. They were learning the basics of high elevation belaying on a well-mapped side of the mountain, and she had to use the bathroom. She went off about 50 yards from the group during a meal break, and did her business. I'll tell the rest exactly as she told it to me so I gotta take a piss, and once I'm done, I start going back to the group. But I've only gotten about 5 feet when I realize that I have no idea where I am. And this wasn't a oh, I got turned around lost. I mean I had literally no clue where I was. If you'd asked me, I don't even think I'd have been able to tell you what state we were in. It was sort of how I imagine people with amnesia feel, you know? You're completely lost, and you have no idea what to do. So I stood there for a while, just trying to figure out where I was and what I was supposed to do. But the longer I stand there, the more confused and turned around I get, so I started walking. As I recall, I just picked a random direction and went for it. And as I'm walking, it's just getting worse and worse to the point where I have no concept of why I'm on the mountain in the first place. I'm just trudging through the snow, and then I start hearing this voice. It's kind of inside my head, almost. Like if a frog could talk, all low and croaky. And it's telling me over and over it's okay, it's okay, you just need to find something to eat. Find something to eat and you'll be okay, just keep walking and find something to eat. 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 So I start looking around for anything that I can eat, and I swear to god I've never felt that hungry in my whole life. It was bottomless, and I think that I had eaten just about anything you put in front of me right then. I had no concept of time, so I had no idea how long I'd been out when I hear an actual voice coming toward me. I go toward it and see one of the other SARs, and he looks terrified. He's running toward me, asking if I'm okay and what the hell I'm doing out here. And the scary thing was, as he's running toward me, I kind of see myself reaching into my belt for my hunting knife. I'm not even really thinking about what I'm doing, but what I am thinking is that I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'll never be okay again, so I just have to eat. He sees me doing that and he backs off right away. He yells at me to put my knife away, that he's not gonna hurt me, and that kind of snaps me back. All of a sudden, I know exactly where I am, and I put the knife away. I run to him and ask him how long I've been gone, thinking he'll tell me I've been gone for half an hour or so. But he tells me I've been gone for two days. I've gone over two peaks and ended up almost on the other side of the mountain, and if I'd kept going, I would have ended up wandering into about 300 miles of wilderness. They'd never have found me. He can't believe I'm not dead, and of course I don't know what to think. To me, no time has passed at all. I don't say anything, I just go back with him to a rendezvous point, and I'm taken back to HQ to be airlifted to the hospital. When I get there, they do all kinds of tests, and try to figure out what happened. As best they can guess, I had some kind of weird fugue state, which is kind of like amnesia, or a weird seizure that knocked my brain out of whack. But the truth is that we really don't know. It's never happened again, but I'll tell you, ever since then I never go out there alone. People rag on me for making them come with me when I have to leave the group, but I just tell them that listening to me piss in the snow is better than losing me for two days on a freezing mountain. The next person I talked to was E.W., a former trainer who now works as an EMT. He still comes to ops like this to help out, but doesn't work full-time for us anymore. He specialized in finding lost kids, he just seemed to have a sixth sense when it came to knowing where they'd gone. He's a legend among the more senior vets, but he gets embarrassed if you compliment him on his work. He sat down with me at dinner one evening, and we ended up swapping stories. Most of them were just casual, but when we got on the subject of our weirder calls, I mentioned that I'd had a buddy who'd gone up a set of stairs. He got kind of quiet and asked me if I'd heard of a little boy who'd disappeared from his park a few years back. 
I hadn't, so he told me this story. They were out looking for this 11-year-old boy, Joey, who'd gone missing near a river. Of course, the first thought was that he'd fallen in and drowned, but when they brought dogs out, they led SAR officers away from the river and up into a very densely forested area. When we do searches for people, we search in a grid pattern, and we search every box of the grid incredibly thoroughly. What EW's team noticed right away was that a very strange pattern was emerging. Dogs in alternating boxes were picking up Joey's scent, but losing it when they overlapped with another box. If you think of a checkerboard, Joey's scent was being picked up in random black squares, but never in red. This, of course, didn't make any sense, because how could the kid bounce from area to area without leaving a scent in each place he passed? EW and his partner pass into a new box of the grid, and EW notices a set of stairs about 50 yards away. He tells his partner that they need to go check near it, but his partner flat out refuses. He tells EW that he's made it a point never to go near any stairs he sees, and that while it may be routine, he's not to pretend that it's normal. He tells EW that he'll wait in sight while EW checks. EW says he was irritated, but he felt for the guy, and didn't push him on the subject. I walked over to the stairs. They were small, kind of like stairs into a basement. I don't really feel strongly one way or the other about them. The stairs I mean, so I wasn't scared or anything. I guess I'm like everyone else, and I just prefer not to think about them too much. Anyway, I went over and I could see that there was something lying on the bottom step, sort of curled up. My hair sinks, because of course you always hope for the best. And we were confident that we'd find this kid alive, because he'd only been missing for a few hours. But I knew right away that it was him, and that he was dead. He was curled up in a little ball on the step, holding his stomach. It looked like he'd been in horrible pain when he died, but I didn't see any blood except some on his lips and chin. I radioed him that I'd found him, and we got his body back to command. That poor family, they were devastated. The parents couldn't understand how he'd be dead, cause he'd only been gone for such a short amount of time. And on top of that we didn't have any obvious cause of death, which just made it worse. I figured he'd probably eaten something poisonous, since he was holding his stomach when I found him, but I didn't want to guess. It's hard enough to hear that your kid is dead, let alone have some stupid SAR guy guessing about what happened. They took him away, and I went home and tried not to think about it. I hate finding dead kids, man. I love this job but it's one of the reasons I left. I've got two daughters, and the thought of losing them that way just. He choked up a little here. I'm not great with emotional stuff like that, and it's always sort of awkward to see a grown man cry, so I didn't really know what to do. He pulled himself together eventually, though, and he kept going. We don't always hear back from the coroners about cause of death. It's not really our job to know, I guess, and sometimes if they think it's foul play they won't tell us because of legal bullshit. But I've got a friend who works for the sheriff's department, and he'll usually pass along any interesting info if I ask. In this case, though, I actually got a call from him about a week later. He asks if I remember the kid, and of course I do, and he says some seriously weird shit is going on. He tells me, EW, man, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but the coroner has no idea what happened to this kid. He's never seen anything like it. My friend goes on to tell me that when the coroner opened the kid up, he couldn't even believe what he was seeing. The kid's organs were like Swiss cheese. Quarter-sized holes were punched clean through just about every single organ this kid had, aside from his heart and lungs. But his colon, his stomach, his kidneys and even one of his testicles, were full of these clean holes. My friend said the coroner described it as if someone had taken a hole punch and punched holes out of everything, they were so neat. But the kid didn't have a scratch on him, no entry or exit wounds. The closest anyone there had ever seen like it was a guy who'd filled himself full of buckshot a year or so back while cleaning his rifle. No one had a clue what could possibly have caused it. My friend asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like it, or if we'd had similar cases in the past. But I'd never even heard of something like that, and I told him I wasn't going to be of any help to him. As far as I know, 
The coroner determined the cause of death as something like massive internal bleeding, but no one knows what really happened. I've never been able to forget that kid. I have nightmares about it sometimes. I don't let my kids go into the woods alone, and when we go together I never let them out of my sight. I used to love it out here. But that case, and a couple others, just sort of ruined it for me. Dinner was over, so we started to clean up and go back to our cabins. Before we went our separate ways, he put his hand on my shoulder and looked at me really close. He tells me that there's bad things out here. Things that don't care if we have families or lives, or that we can think and feel. He tells me to be careful, and he walks away. I didn't have a chance to talk with him again, but that story stuck with me. By pure coincidence, I got to talk to another vet, PB who's been in the SAR field for years. We were partnered on a grid sweep during a training exercise, and we were chatting casually about how we liked the job, what kinds of things we'd seen, and the like. At one point, we passed an old set of stairs, though these were probably from an old fire lookout, given the area that we were in. I sort of casually mentioned that I was curious about the stairs and that I wished I knew more about them. He got kind of quiet and looked like he wanted to tell me something, but wasn't sure if he should. Finally, he told me to turn my radio off. Obviously, this is something we are never ever supposed to do, but I did it, and he did the same. About 7 years ago, he tells me he was out on a call with a rookie. They were in an area of the park that's had a lot of strange reports and events. Disappearances, stories about lights in the forest, odd noises, things like that. The rookie was totally spooked, kept going on and on about things out in the woods. According to PB, the guy wouldn't stop talking about the goat man. Just on and on, goat man this and goat man that. Finally, I told him that there was plenty else to be afraid of out here that was very real. and that he'd better get over this thing with the goat man. The rookie wanted to know what kinds of things I was talking about, and I just told him to shut up and walk. We crested a little ridge and there was a staircase about 10 yards ahead. The rookie stops dead in his tracks and just stands there looking at them. I tell him, "See? That's something you should be afraid of." The rookie asks me what the hell these are doing out here, and for some reason, I just open up and tell him the truth. or what i've been told is the truth i could have gotten in a lot of trouble for doing what i did and i could get in a lot of trouble for repeating it to you but you're a nice kid and i want you to stop looking into this quit while you're ahead so i'll tell you what i know under the condition that you never breathe a word of this to the soups i told him i wouldn't say a word and he double checks that our radios are off when i first started out We were a little less tight-lipped about them and other things that happen out here. We warned people before they were even hired that there was weird shit going on. I guess the forest service was tired of having such a massive turnover rate and they wanted people to know what they were getting into. So they started having people sign these agreements that they wouldn't go to the media about what they were going to see. The FS didn't want to scare people away. So the last thing they needed were spooked rookies running off to the media with stories of ghosts and haunted stairs. But eventually, they found that the agreements weren't necessary. People not only didn't want to talk about what they saw, they wouldn't. A few times, media tried to talk to people when kids or hikers would disappear, and no one would say a word. I can't really explain it. I guess we just don't really want to admit anything is wrong. This is our job. to be out in the woods every single day. We don't need to be spooked, and the best way to avoid that is to pretend like everything's okay. So I'll tell you everything I can think of, and after that, I'm done talking about it for good. And I expect you not to bring it up around me ever. The stairs have been out here as long as the parks have existed. We have records going back decades describing them. Sometimes people go up them and nothing happens. Other times Look, I really don't like talking about this, but sometimes really bad shit happens. I saw one guy get his hand sliced clean off when he got to the top step. He reached out to touch a tree branch and it happened so fast. One second his hand was there and the next it was gone. Completely clean wound. We didn't find his hand and the guy almost died. Another time, a woman touched one of the stairs 
and a blood vessel in her brain exploded. Literally exploded, like a water balloon. She sort of stumbled down and came over to me, and all she got out was I think something is wrong with me. She dropped like a sack of flour, dead before she hit the ground. I'll never forget the way the blood leaked into the inside of her eye. Before she died, I watched it turn red. I watched it happen and there wasn't a single thing I could do to help. We warn people not to go anywhere near them but there's always at least one idiot who does. And even if nothing happens to them, something bad always happens. Kids go missing as we're on their trail. Someone dies the next day, cut in half in a completely safe part of the park. I don't know why, but something bad always happens. I don't know exactly why they're out here, but it doesn't matter. They're here, and if we were smart, we'd tell our new officers exactly what they're capable of. We were both quiet for a little while. I was afraid to talk because I wasn't sure if he was done. He looked like he wanted to say something else. Finally he spoke up again. Have you ever noticed how you can't find the same ones twice? I nodded, expecting him to continue. But he just stayed quiet, walking alongside me, and eventually he started a story about the biggest deer he'd ever seen in the park. I didn't bring up the subject again, and I didn't press him for any more stories. He dropped out of the op the next day. Apparently he left before the sun came up, he said he was sick. None of us have heard from him since he left. A firefighter who was helping us at the training op told me about a call he'd gone on, supposedly to help rescue a kid from an absolutely massive tree. He said they didn't give him details, just that they needed him to come out and help because they lacked the proper equipment. He'd been called out specifically because this thing was so huge that the SARs didn't feel safe trying to climb it. He'd been a tree trimmer before joining the VFD, so it was easy enough for him to grab his old equipment and come help out. He was let out about two miles, and the team stopped at one of the biggest trees in the area and pointed up. He laughed and asked the op captain how the kid had gotten up there, made some joke about the old cat in a tree thing, but the captain just shook his head and told him to get up there and get the kid down. He said he knew something was up, but he didn't push it. He said that as he climbed this tree, he started wondering if they were playing a prank on him. There was no way this kid should have been able to climb this thing. It was massive at the base, but about halfway up it started tapering, and I almost had to turn back a few times because I really didn't think it was gonna hold me. But he said he kept going, and when he was just about at the top, he saw a flash of blue in the branches. I saw the kid's shirt sort of caught in a branch, and I called out to him and told him to come near me if he could, but he didn't say anything. I kept moving, calling the kid's name and telling him not to be scared, that I was there to help him. By the time I got to him, I knew he wasn't going to answer me. I found him, or what was left of him, cradled in the fork of a branch, and the fact that he was up there was sheer luck. If he'd fallen any other way, he'd have come crashing down. It wouldn't have mattered though, because this kid was dead long before he ended up in that tree. I don't know who put him there, or how, or why, but it was sick. Kid's intestines had popped out of his mouth, and were hanging in the branches. It was like some sick Christmas tree, the way they were draped all over everything. I got a better look and saw they'd even popped out of his ass, his guts were hanging out the bottom of his pants. His eyes were gone, I assume shoved out from whatever force caused him to pop like a stress ball. You ever seen a body that's been floating in water for a long time, how their tongues kind of swell up and stick out? His was like that. I remember because there were flies crawling all over it. I think I must have gone into shock, because. Man I just pushed that kid down with a stick I broke off a branch. Just kind of poked him until he fell. I don't know why I did that. I almost lost my job because of that. But man the thought of hauling the kid down over my shoulder the whole way, gathering his guts up and coiling them around me like rope so they wouldn't get snagged. I couldn't do it. I've seen a lot of dead kids. More than I'd ever admit. I've seen a kid who hid in a full bathtub during a house fire, boiled him alive, turned him into literal soup. But this. 
I don't know what did this, but the thought of touching the kid's body made me feel like I was gonna lose my mind. I heard him hit the ground and I figured everyone would freak out, but they knew he was dead when they sent me up there. They didn't say anything, but they didn't shout or freak out or anything. I got to the bottom and I started to get up in the captain's face, asking him who he thought he was sending me up there when they knew damn well the kid was dead. But he just told me it was none of my concern, and thanked me for getting the evidence down. I remember he said that, I remember it specifically because it was so weird to hear it phrased that way. The evidence. Like he wasn't even a person. Like he'd never been a little kid who got lost and had something unspeakable happen to him. The captain had a crew lead me back out of the woods, but he and two others stayed behind, and I thought that was weird. Why wouldn't they have me help get the kid out? I tried asking but the guys leading me out just told me they couldn't discuss an open case. I asked him what he thought had happened to the kid, and he got really pensive and thought about it for a bit. I would have said a crush injury, based on how his guts came out like that, but with those injuries you see massive contusions under the skin, obvious trauma. This wasn't like that. It was almost like that kid got caught in a big vacuum and had his guts sucked out. But even then, there was no trauma. None at all. It bothers me, man. It bothers the hell out of me. One of the vets at the training op reads No Sleep, and he recognized my stories. He knows me pretty well, and we've swapped stories before. He asked if he could share something he's noticed about the stairs, and some thoughts he had. I'm really glad you decided to share these. I think it's important that people be aware of what's out there, especially since the Forest Service is doing such a good job at covering it all up. I asked him what he meant. What do you mean? What do I mean? The lack of any kind of media attention? No coverage of missing kids, or bodies found miles from where they got lost in the first place. David Paulide hit this right on the head, the FS is doing everything they can to keep people coming here, even if it isn't safe. I mean, to be fair, it's not like these things happen every day. But the numbers add up, and it's worth looking into. Especially the stairs. I was surprised you didn't mention the flipped ones. I didn't know what he was talking about, I couldn't remember him ever talking about something like that. He seemed somewhat incredulous. Dude, I can't believe you've been on this long without seeing them. No one told you about them. I shrugged and asked him to elaborate. Well there's the normal stairs, the ones that pop up when we're out of ways. I know you know about them. But sometimes I've run across ones that are flipped upside down. I guess it would be like if you had a dull house, and the stairs were a separate piece. Now take that, flip it upside down so the top step is stuck in the dirt, and put it out in the woods. They're like that. I don't see them as often but they're odd, to say the least. Makes me think of footage taken after a tornado, when houses are all blown apart and random things are left standing, like chimneys and garden walls. Those ones freak me out more than the normal ones because I can't really write those off as easily. I don't scare very easily, like most of us who work out here, but that idea stuck with me, and it bothers me. I'm going to try and find more out about them. He also mentioned how many people were bothered by the guy with no face. He got really excited and told me he'd seen something similar. I was out on a training exercise a few years ago. I was camped out in my tent and I heard someone walking around outside of camp. We're told not to wander far, which you know, so I wondered if maybe it was a rookie who'd gotten up to pee and couldn't find his way back. Remember that guy in our group a few years back who almost fell up the damn mountain? Well I'm paranoid about that happening again, so I got up to see what was going on. I went to the edge of camp and I called to whoever it was and told them that camp was this way. But they kept going back out into the woods, so I went after them. I know it was stupid but I was half asleep and I just really didn't want to deal with some idiot getting hurt. I followed this thing on a dead straight course for about a mile, and then it stopped on the edge of a little river. I could see the outline of it because the water was reflecting the moon, and it looked just like an ordinary guy. He had a pack on, and it looked like he was facing me. I asked if he was okay, if he needed help, and he cocked his head like he didn't understand me. I always have my pocket knife on me, and it's got a little thumb light attached to it, 
so I turned that on and lit up his chest, so I wouldn't blind him. He was breathing slow and deep, so I wondered if he was sleepwalking. I went closer and asked him again if he was okay. I moved the light up, and something didn't seem right, so I stopped. He kept breathing in this real slow, deep breaths, and I sort of figured out gradually that that's what was bothering me. It was like he was pretending to breathe, but not actually doing it. His breaths were too even and deep, and all his movements were exaggerated, like his shoulders going up and his chest moving. I told him to identify himself, and he made this muffled noise. I moved the light up and I shit you not, this guy had no face. Just smooth skin. I freaked out, and I sort of fumbled my light, but I saw him move toward me but he didn't actually move. I don't know how to explain it, but one second he was at the edge of the river and the next he was five feet from me. I never looked away or blinked, it was like he moved so fast my brain couldn't keep up. I tripped and fell on my ass and I could see this line open up on his throat. It stretched up to his ears, and his head tilted back and he smiled at me with his throat. There wasn't any blood, just this gaping dark hole, and I swear he smiled at me with this gash in his throat. I got up and I ran as fast as I could back to camp. I couldn't hear him following me, but I felt like he was always right behind me, even though when I looked back I couldn't see him. I calmed down when I got back to camp, the fire was still going and I guess that pack mentality of being with other people made me stop and breathe a little. I waited by the fire to see if he'd follow me there, but I didn't hear anything else for a few hours, so I went back to bed. I know it sounds weird. But the whole thing was just so surreal that it was almost like I immediately wrote it off as my imagination. We were telling ghost stories one night before bed just to scare each other and poke fun at whoever got creeped out. Most of the time it's the rookies, but one woman told a story that actually managed to get under my skin a little bit, and I know the same was true for others. She said it was true, but then again, every ghost story told around a campfire is true. Somehow, though, I don't think she was making it up. It had that ring of truth that only really traumatizing events have. She said that when she was a kid, she and her friend used to go out in the woods behind her house a lot. She lived in northern Maine, where there's a lot of dense, unpopulated national forest. She said the woods up there aren't like they are here. They're so thick in places that the trees block out the sun almost completely. She and her friend grew up there, so they weren't scared of being out there alone, but they did always maintain a sense of caution in certain areas. She said it was never really talked about, but they always knew not to go more than a mile or two beyond their homes. The adults never said why, but it was an unspoken rule that no one ventured out that far. She and her friend made up stories about bears as big as houses that lived out there, and they used to scare each other by hiding and making growling noises while the other searched for them. She said one summer, there was a series of awful storms that blew down a lot of trees, and set one part of the forest a few miles behind her house on fire. Fire crews got it under control, but she said some of them came back not quite the same. It was like they'd been to war. You could tell who'd really gotten scared because they had the same look on their faces, I think it's called shell shock. My friend and I said they were like walking dead people. They didn't smile or say anything if you went up to them, and most of them left town as soon as everything was over. I asked my parents about it, but they said they didn't know what I was talking about. Once everyone was told the woods were safe again, my friend and I decided to try and hike out to where the fire had been. We didn't tell out parents where we were going, and it was pretty exciting to think that we were disobeying them like that. We hiked out about two miles or so, and we started seeing burnt trees and stuff. I remember my friend got really upset because we found the skeleton of a deer curled up under a tree, and I practically had to drag her away. She wanted to bury it, but I didn't want her touching it because its antlers were weird. I can't remember why, I just remember thinking that there was something wrong with them and I didn't want either of us going near it. The farther we went, the more burnt everything got. Eventually, there were no standing trees, and it was like being on another planet. Almost nothing green, just brown and black everywhere. We were standing there looking at it all, and we both heard someone shouting in the distance. I panicked because I thought it was my dad, and that he was going to tell me I was grounded. 
My friend broke off and went to hide behind a big rock, because she said she didn't want to be caught out here. Her parents had forbidden her to come out in the woods at all, and she'd lied and told them we were going to a movie. I followed her, and we kept listening. I could hear this voice getting closer, and I realized they were calling for help. I thought maybe it was some hiker who'd gotten lost and needed directions back to town. That used to happen all the time, so I was used to helping people out. I heard him following my voice, so I kept calling out until I saw him running in the distance. He got closer and I could see that his face was all red. I told my friend to give me her pack, because she had a first aid kit. She made this noise like she was grossed out, and she asked if I saw his face. I told her to shut up, and I jogged up to meet him. I stopped about halfway, and when he stopped in front of me I could see that his nose and lips and part of his forehead were all gone. It was like they'd been sliced clean off. He was bleeding bad, and I saw that the knees of his pants were red too. I took a step back but I was too scared to move much, and he grabbed my shoulders. It felt like I got a shock, and he jerked back. He started babbling, and I couldn't tell what he was saying, except that he kept asking how long he'd been gone. He asked me where his unit was, but I just shook my head. He looked me over and he saw my Walkman and he screamed. He just kept babbling and touching his face, and I realized he wasn't wearing the right clothing. He had some kind of weird grey cloth jacket and almost formal pants on, and the jacket had these weird buttons and red borders on it. I kept shaking my head and I told him I couldn't understand what he was saying. I went to open the first aid kit but he just screamed again and said the only thing I could really understand, don't touch me. You'll make me go back there. After that, he ran off and I could hear him screaming the whole time. When I couldn't hear him anymore, I turned around, and my friend was crying. I just turned around and started walking back toward town. She asked me over and over what had happened and who that was, but I didn't say anything. When we got home, I told her I didn't want to play in the woods with her anymore. We're still friends, but we don't talk about that guy. Not ever. When I started out as a rookie, No one had told me a lot about the job in terms of weird things that could happen. I'm assuming this was largely to prevent me from freaking out and abandoning the park. But a few months into my service, when I was still a rookie, a friend and I were drunk at a party, and he opened up a bit, yeah, it can get a little crazy out there, I guess. I think the worst are the ones where people die when they just shouldn't, you know? or when we find them dead like 10 minutes after someone says they saw them last. They were fine when I passed them on the switchback, I swear. That's sort of. Like, kick this guy who I found one spring out on a really popular trail. Someone comes into the VC freaking about about some guy who's lying in the middle of the path in this giant pool of blood. So we run out there, and we find this guy dead as a doornail. Which he absolutely should be because the back of his head is like mashed potatoes. The skull is decimated, brains are leaking out like custard filling, and a guy's old so you figure yeah, he probably fell and hit his head. Old people fall all the time, it's no big deal. Except that this area where he fell doesn't have any big rocks. There's not even any stumps or big branches. And on top of that, there's no blood trail, so he clearly died where he dropped. Now that's when you turn to murder, but there were people just out of line of sight with the guy. If someone came up behind him and murdered him, there's no way someone wouldn't have heard. And again, even if someone had, there'd be a blood trail, spatter all over the place. But everyone on the scene said it looked exactly like he'd fallen and smashed his head on a rock. So what the did he hit his head on? And then there was this lady I found in a different park about five years ago, back when I was upstate. We found her in the middle of a stand of big junipers, curled around the trunk, like she was hugging it. We pick her up to move her, and a waterfall comes out of her mouth, splashes all over my shoes. Her clothes are dry, and her hair is dry, but the amount of water in her lungs and stomach was phenomenal. Unreal, man. Coroner's report? Says the cause of death was drowning. Her lungs were completely full of water. This, even though we're in the middle of the high desert, and there isn't a body of water for miles. No puddles, no nothing. No signs of anyone else being out there. I mean yeah, 
It's possible they were murdered. But why go out of the way to do it like that? Why not just stab him and be done with it? I dunno, it just sits weird with me. A guy with Down syndrome in his 20s went missing after his family lost sight of him on a major path. That was odd in and of itself, because this guy never left his mom's side. She was absolutely convinced he'd been kidnapped, and unfortunately a ranger who isn't with the park anymore insinuated that no one was going to kidnap someone. Well, with that kind of disability. Not very tactful, to say the least. We wasted a lot of time trying to calm her down enough to get information about him, and then we put out an official missing persons call. Because of the urgency of the situation, him being mostly unable to function alone, we had local police come in and help us. We didn't find him the first night, which was heartbreaking. None of us wanted to think of him being alone out there. We assumed he'd just kept wandering, and was staying ahead of us. We brought out Healy's the next day and they spotted him in a little canyon. I helped bring him back up, but he was in bad shape, and I think we all knew he wasn't gonna make it. He'd fallen and broken his spine, and couldn't feel his lower half. He'd also broken both his legs, one at the femur, and he'd lost a lot of blood. He was confused and scared while he was alone, so he'd probably exacerbated the injuries by dragging himself a little ways. I know it sounds awful, but while I was riding in the copter with him, I asked him why he'd wandered off. I just wanted something to tell his mother, to let her know it wasn't her fault, because he was fading fast and I didn't think she'd get to ask him herself. He was crying, and he said something about how the little sad boy had wanted him to come play. He said the little boy wanted to trade so he could go home. Then he closed his eyes, and when he woke up again, he was in the canyon. I'm not sure that's exactly what he said, but it was what I thought the gist of it was. He kept crying, asking where his mommy was, and I held his hand and tried my best to keep him calm. It was cold out there. He kept saying that. It was cold out there. My legs was frozen. It was cold out there. It's cold in me. He was getting even weaker, so he eventually stopped talking, and he closed his eyes for a while. Then, when we were about five minutes from the hospital, he looked right at me, with these big tears running down his face, and he said mama won't see me no more. Love mama, wish she was here. And he closed his eyes and he just. Never woke up. It was horrible, and I don't like talking about it. That case was one of the first ones that really rattled me badly. Because of how badly it affected me, I reached out to a senior ranger, and who ended up helping me through it. As time went on, and we got to know each other better, he ended up sharing one of his own stories with me. It was disturbing, but it helped to know that I wasn't the only one affected by the things going on out there. I think this must have happened before you got here, because I think if it had happened while you were here you'd have remembered it. I know it didn't end up in the news, for some reason, but I think most people who've been here long enough know about it. The park sold off a portion of land to a logging company, and it was a really controversial thing. But it wasn't that large or old of a plot, and it was right after the recession, so we needed cash bad. Anyway, they were felling this plot of land, and we get a call that we need to get our supervisors out right away. I don't know why, but they ended up sending me and a few other guys along with the heads, I guess for power in numbers, to see what was up. We got there, and all these guys are crowded around a tree that they've just cut down. They're all pissed off and freaking out and the foreman comes over and says he wants to know what we think we're up to. What the hell y'all think this is, some kind of sick joke. You've got a lot of nerve pulling this, we bought this land fair and square. Well we don't know what the hell he's talking about. So he brings us over to this felled tree and points at it and tells us that when they cut it down, it was just like this and they'll be damned if they put it there. The inside of the tree was all rotted out and hollow in one spot. And when they'd cut it down it had exposed that chamber, and inside it is a hand. Like a perfectly severed hand. And looks like it's actually fused with the inside of the tree. Well now we think they're pulling a joke, so we tell them that we don't like being messed with, and we start to leave, but they tell us they've already called the cops, and that they'll go right to the media if we don't stick around. Well that gets the head's attention, so they stick around and talk to the police about it. 
everyone is denying that they put the hand in there, and besides, how would anyone have even done it? It's clearly a real hand, but it's not mummified or skeletal. It's brand new, probably not even a day old. And it is definitely fused with the wood, you can see that it's coming right out of it. The loggers, they insist that they didn't put it there. Somehow, this fresh human hand ended up fused to the inside of this living tree. The cops have them cut up that section of tree into a movable chunk. Then they take the hand away, and the area is closed off. There was a pretty big investigation, but I know they didn't find get any answers. Now it's become this legend, and as far as I know we haven't sold any more property for logging. As you all know, I went to a training seminar recently, and heard some amazing and horrible things there. One of the guys I talked to while I was there told me a story when we were all around the campfire one night. We were both pretty drunk, you'll see a pattern here, and we were swapping stories. He told me this one, me and another guy were out on a field search because some campers reported screaming noises at night. So we head out there to look for whatever mountain lion has wandered into the area, and I'm pissed. We've had three of them show up in the camping areas that year alone and I'm getting tired as hell of constantly having to deal with them. Plus, I just don't like them anyway. They're a pain in the ass and they're loud and they scare me. Cats. Pieces of. I'm groaning about it to the guy I'm with and he thinks it's a real riot. So we're seeing all these broken branches and what look like dens and we're pretty sure we know where this thing is. I call in and they tell me to confirm if possible which you know just means they want you to step in and use that as proof. I'm not seeing any, though, so I basically just tell him to shove it, I'm done. We know that damn thing's out here somewhere, even if I'm not stepping in or inside its mouth or whatever. Guy I'm with wanders off to take a piss or whatever, and I stay behind watching this little burrow under a tree to see if maybe a fox or something is living under it, cause I love foxes, man. They're cute as hell. But anyway, I'm watching this tree and I start hearing branches crackling and it's coming from the direction my partner went opposite of. Now I've got my pistol, but you and I both know that's not gonna do against a cat. I cock it and holler for my partner to get his dumbass back, but he's too far and he can't hear me. I stand up and get my sights on where the thing is approaching, and I kid you not, man, I just about peed myself. This guy is coming toward me, and he's back flipping through the woods. Like, instead of walking, he's doing these crazy backflips, and I swear to God he cleared every log and bush in his path, it was like he knew right where he was going. I yell at the guy to stop right where he is, that I'm pointing a gun right at him, but he keeps coming, and I just kinda lost it. I shot at the ground in front of him, and it was a dumb thing to do, but man I didn't want this guy anywhere near me. When I fired, he was about 50 yards from me, and as soon as the gun goes off, he whirls around and goes off, back flipping back into the woods. My partner hears my gun go off and runs back and asks what's up, and I tell him there's some weirdo out here hopped up on god knows what, and we need to get the hell out of Dodge. I let the cops know what happened, and I didn't get in any trouble for firing, but man, I don't know what that MF was on but I've never seen anything like that before. It was absolutely crazy. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.